This is the Bible Explained by Pastor Michael Yeo. Before we begin, let us prepare our hearts through worship. I've had good days, I've had bad days, tasted victory and defeat. I've had problems big as planets Turn to pebbles when you speak I've had nothing to my name Never lacked for anything Cause you were there with me You've been my savior, sustainer Shalom, shalom, and welcome to our Bible study on the book of James. And before we go further, let us have a quick review of our last session on judging others. And taking from our lesson from James 4 verse 11 to 12, we learned that to resolve conflicts, you need to stop judging others. And secondly, to resolve conflicts, you need to submit to God's Word. And if you have missed, missed this lesson, please check it out on our church Facebook page or our church YouTube channel. It is available for you on demand. Now, today we have another great lesson for you and which we have entitled, Life is a Mist. Taking from James 4, verse 13 to 17. Now, believe it or not, a large number of people have chosen to be reminded five times a day via a smartphone app that they are going to die. The app called We Croak. 
has more than 10,000 downloads and there are 30,000 monthly users. More than 25 million reminders are sent annually. Most of the messages are simply, don't forget, you are going to die. Now, others are equally as somber. The grave has no sunny corners, it sends. And the other says, those who are afraid of death will carry it on their shoulders. Now, the messages are sent at random times and at any moment, just like death. The founders of this app were inspired by a famous Bhutanese folk saying which asserts to be a truly happy person, one must contemplate death five times daily. Now, the basic idea is that the more we are reminded about the certainty of death, the more we will smell the flowers and appreciate every moment of life. And in today's passage, James reminds us of the certainty of death in perhaps in another way. He says, life is a vapour, like a morning mist that soon vanishes. So life is short and uncertain. There are no guarantees about tomorrow, let alone next year or even 10 years from now. Now here, James is beginning a new section, but the connecting theme throughout chapters 4 and 5 is humility. True faith judges pride by humbling oneself before God. And in chapter 4, verse 1 to 12, James hit the need for humility to resolve conflicts and have harmonious relationships. And now, he turns to the subject of humility with regards to the future. He is confronting an arrogant spirit that he had observed among Christians and among churches. Although these people profess to know Christ, they were living with a worldly attitude that the Apostle John calls the boastful pride of life. They were making plans without taking into account their own mortality and God's sovereignty. Now, like the prosperous man in Jesus' parable in Luke chapter 12, and it says, And he said, I will do this, I will tear down my barns, build larger ones, and then I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? Now in our passage today, James makes four points. Number one is this, life is a vapour. James 4, 13 to 14, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now this means three things. Number one, life is frail. We don't even know what will happen even 10 minutes from now, let alone tomorrow or even next year. Now, these businessmen mentioned by James, they were arrogantly assuming that they would wake up tomorrow, that they would safely get to the city and that their business venture would be successful within a year and that no one would rob them of their income. Now, they were presuming all of these things about an unknown future that they had no control of and no guarantees about. The fact is this, the most healthy person among us could easily be diagnosed with a terminal disease. Some years ago, I lost a close friend who just collapsed with a massive stroke 
after a badminton game and just pass on just like that. And he was just only 48 years old. Of course, you may protest that to think about such things is morbid and depressing. Well, I am not suggesting that we get obsessed on these things and allow fear to grip us. But if we don't ever think about them, we will not live in proper dependence upon God. We will proudly make plans and go, go on about life as if we will be forever young and healthy. Now James says in 4.16 that all such boasting is evil. The second suggestion is that life is short. A vapour is short-lived. You see the steam coming out of your coffee cup and in just a second, it disappears into the air. Life is just like that. In Psalms 90, Moses laments about the brevity of life. In Psalms 90, verse 10, the years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Now, even if you live to be a hundred, how quickly life flies by. Someone says that life is like the roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the quicker it goes. Now, that's why Moses prays in Psalms 90 verse 12. So, teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. And the third thing is that death is certain. George Bernard Shaw astutely observed the statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of one people die. Now you would think that because death is not just probable but absolutely certain and that it can happen at any minute and that each person must stand before God for judgment Every person would be desperate to know how to get right with God. But strangely, people put it out of mind and go on about lies as if they will live forever. They can watch the catastrophe of the 2004 Indian tsunami on the news, shake their heads in disbelief at the more than 200,000 bodies floating in the water and go out the door to their daily routines without considering what is most important in life, a right relationship with God. Jesus taught us how to think when we hear about such disasters. Some people reported to him about some Galileans whom Pilate had slaughtered. And Jesus responded in Luke chapter 13, and he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? Because they suffered in this way. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Not to be ready for something that is 100% certain would be really foolish. Are you ready for death if it comes today? So James' first point is this, life is a vapour. Secondly, God is sovereign. Now, this means we are not sovereign. James 4.15 says, Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. The problem was not that these businessmen were making plans for the future. Now, planning. Planning is commended to us in Scripture. Luke 14.28, Jesus says, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Now, financial planning is good 
stewardship if it is done in dependence on God and with regard for biblical priorities. The problem was these businessmen were arrogant. They were making plans for their future financial security, but their plans did not include God. Their trust was not in God, but in their business ventures and in all of the money that they supposed that they will make. They were assuming that they were in control of their future and that everything would go according to their plans. Now, instead, as James pointed out, that they needed to acknowledge if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. James is here giving us a mindset that needs to permeate all of our life. We need continually to be aware of our finiteness and dependence on God and His sovereign purpose in every aspect of our life. Sometimes we should say, if the Lord wills, but even if we don't say it, we should think it. I think one of the most basic and helpful lessons in life to learn is God is God and I am not God. He is sovereign, I am not sovereign. He controls the future. I do not in any way control the future. I believe in saying and investing as I'm able towards the day when I may be too feeble to work, but there is simply no such thing in this world as financial security. It is impossible to cover all possible contingencies. Our economy may crash. My retirement investments, they may fail. Now, trusting in God is the only true source of security for the future. Note also that James assumed that you should acknowledge God as the sovereign over your business life. If you are a businessman, your business ethics should reflect that you are not in charge of your business. Christ is in charge. You must conduct your business dealings in a manner that pleases and glorifies God. So James states that life is a vapour and that God is sovereign over every aspect of life. And his words imply a third truth and that is this. Pride is a great sin that easily plagues us all. Verse 13 reeks with arrogance. Today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. There is a lot of mention of what the businessman will do, but there isn't any mention of God. In 4.16, James directly confronts the sinful attitude behind the commands of 4.13. James 4.16 As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. The word arrogance was originally used of wandering scammers who were full of empty and boastful claims about their cures and other feats that they could accomplish. Now, it came to apply to anyone who boasts out of pride. It is used in 1 John 2.15, the boastful pride of life. Now, it refers to the arrogant self-sufficiency of the world apart from God. Now, we see this attitude in the powerful Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. And he reads this way, At the end of 12 months, Nebuchadnezzar was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon and the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? And while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom 
has departed from you and you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of man and gives it to whom he will. And immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and he ate grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagles' feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. Now probably James' readers who were professing Christians were not as extreme as Nebuchadnezzar in proclaiming their own greatness. But it is always possible for a Christian to fall into practical atheism where he proudly thinks, I have decided to do this and nothing is going to stop me. I'm a man of strong will. I will succeed. He smiles at his own resolve and strength of character. Now James says that all such boasting is evil. Or it's easy for us as Christians to think, I have succeeded because of my own hard work and smart business sense. We disdain the poor, thinking if they would only work hard as I have done, they could succeed too. But we are forgetting Paul's pointed question to the proud Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What do you have that you did not receive? If then you receive it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Everything we have comes from God by His grace. We fall into pride when we do not keep that in mind. How then? Shall we live in view of the fact that life is a vapour, that God is sovereign and that we are so prone to pride? Well, number four says, humble obedience to God's revealed will is our only reasonable response. James 4, 17, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Here James urge us to take the Lord into consideration in all our planning. We have no excuse in this matter. We know what we are to do. To fail now, to do it, James wants to make it clear it is sin. Of course, this verse applies to all areas of the Christian life pertaining to what are called sins of omission. Now, we all tend to focus on sins where we have violated some direct command of God. Perhaps we stole something in violation of God's command not to steal. Or we lied in violation of God's command to tell the truth. But we also sin when we fail to do something positive that God has commanded us to do. Obviously, we can't all do everything or there simply would not be enough hours in the day. But if you are a Christian, it is not enough just to avoid sinning. God has given you a spiritual gift and He calls you to serve Him in some capacity. To know this and to neglect, to get involved in serving to me is sin, according to the principle laid forth by James. Now, in view of the fact that life is a vapour, that God is sovereign, that pride is a constant battle, and that humble obedience to God's will is the only sane cause, I would advise you to do this. Think about what God wants your life to look like on your deathbed. What will you have accomplished that matters in the light of eternity? In views of God's purpose for your life, you can consider writing out a single sentence personal mission statement. 
and then write out some personal lifetime goals that will help you fulfill your mission statement. And to get things going, perhaps think through some short-term personal goals in various areas where you know you need to grow in. Now, it can be spiritual goals, alright? It also can be financial goals, it can be family goals, it can be ministry goals, it can be health goals, it can be relationship goals. Now, these are just examples and suggestions. Your personal goals will vary. But write them down, pray about it, and then review them periodically and adjust as the Lord leads you. The aim is to number your days so as to present to the Lord a heart of wisdom. You know that you ought to do these things and James says that if you don't do them to you, it is a considered sin. So let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your word that gives us a wider perspective of our experiences and circumstances. Thank you for reminding us that life is frail, life is short, and that physical death is certain. Sovereign God, help us to obediently align ourselves to your plans and purposes, for this is what you are pleased with. Help us to number and treasure our days indeed, and not to waste the time you have blessed us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank you. Thank you once again for your time and for your attention. You have been blessed by these studies. Please, please like and share our church FB page and YouTube channel. And we will see you in our next lesson as we continue with James chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. And we will consider what James has to say about wealth without God. And now to get the best from the Bible study, please read the relevant passages before you join the class. And if you have any questions at all regarding today's lesson, please, please feel free to email us at equip at churchofpraise.org.my and we will get back to you as soon as possible. God bless you.